I know you got a prime pump there. Uh, he asked me the question of the, you know, with subcontractors, who is necessarily, not, not to blame, but do they have a responsibility to kind of be successful? Obviously, we want to position them for success, but don't they have a stake in this too? And the answer is yes. I work with about 50% trade contractor, 50% GC. And I can tell you, it's kind of like uh, Congress. You know, both sides are to blame in a lot of issues because we can't find that happy medium. For instance, the GCs I see will go, all our subs suck. Uh, and I go, okay, but are you helping them plan? I don't have time to do that stuff. I tell them they just should show up. Well, subcontractors are heavy labor intensive. You know, so getting a crew of five to 10 people, and I know crews go much bigger than that, um, or multiple crews for that matter, how do we just start the locomotive? You know, if you've ever seen a cruise ship or been on a cruise ship, think of a trade contractor like a cruise ship. You know, how do they turn? Well, they don't corner like a Ferrari, do they? You gotta make a real big berth because they gotta get the labor engine fired up. Well, same thing with trade contractors. Now, all that being said, we have an oppor or a opportunity and a need to position them to be successful. On the other hand, some of these subs are their own worst enemy, and that was the comment I was making a few moments ago. Uh, some of these subs, I've seen them. They don't plan, they're reactive, they're like some of the people I've used as case studies because they don't set themselves, they don't have the Starbucks way of doing things. So in addition to if Benning doesn't have the Benning way of doing things and a sub doesn't have the sub way of doing things, that's just a really bad cup of coffee all the way around. And that's the point we're going to. We've got to come a little to make sure we're helping set them up for success, being the squeaky wheel, and we have to hold people accountable. So if that sub is underperforming, we also need to have a process to give them feedback. Hey, at the end of the job, you guys really didn't do these things right and give that constructive feedback. Now, it's easy for me to go to an estimator and say, oh, this painter is awful. This painter sucks. Why? Why specifically do they suck? You know, were they not safe? Did they not man the job right? Did we ask for a schedule and say, hey, show me how you're gonna build this job. How many people are gonna be on your painting crew? Uh, one guy, and we're gonna work for 45 days straight. Uh, that's not gonna work. I want a bigger crew, less duration, and we find that way. So I don't have a answer to say, here, take this pill and it'll make your subs better. However, if we apply better management and demand more and be that squeaky wheel, we might get better performance. But even then, you can only come about so far because you don't run their business for them. And trust me, there are plenty of bad subs. All that being said, we asked at the beginning of the program, I asked this gentleman how old he was. So how long have you been in the business? In uh, Benny? Construction. Two years. I've uh, been working in construction since I was 16. Okay. That was a pretty long time, actually. Uh, I would ask for the oldest guy in the room, but I'm not going to because that just wouldn't be cool. But however, I was in uh, Bristol. Uh, it's either Bristol, Tennessee, or Bristol, North Carolina, or Bristol, Virginia. It's like right on that kind of corner where they run the NASCAR race. And I asked this question to a contractor, and there was a guy in the room. So I went around the room and said, how long have you been doing this construction? If you've been doing it for five years, raise your hand. Everyone raise their hand. 10 years. 15 years. We went on and on like that. And finally, there was one guy, little tiny old man in the back of the room. And when I say old, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just telling you, the guy was 75 years old. And I said, how long have you been doing this? No joke. He said for 55 years. And I said, 55 years? I'm like, how did, how did you do that? He goes, well, Greg, here's the deal. My uncle started this business, so I started, you know, back in the day, and I'm sure like you, you said it's 16, yeah, maybe sweeping up around the yard, doing general labor stuff, things we can make a, a kid do. Uh, and then I was a foreman, a superintendent. He goes, now I drive the truck for the company. Now folks, I don't know about you, but I live in Heaven's Waiting Room called Florida, and this little 75-year-old man driving this huge truck with all their equipment on it just scared the heck out of me. <laughs> See him, you know, just going around. <laughs> 
But I asked him this question, the same one I'm about to ask you. Have things in the construction industry changed or have they stayed the same? And he had a very interesting response. He said, Greg, I say both. And I said, why? He goes, well, Greg, we've done some things in this industry that I think are pretty progressive. On the other hand, we've also done some things to really shoot ourselves in the foot as an industry. This is not betting. This is an industry. So the question I have for you, I want you at your table to list all the challenges and all the changes that you've seen for however long you've been doing this thing called construction. Now, what I want you to do is list the change, list whether it's controllable. <coughs> or uncontrollable. Folks, if you say, boy, global warming and the weather's changed, okay, maybe, but what I can't tell you is this. Do you control that? Last time I checked, I don't. <laughs> I don't have the power to stop the rain tomorrow. So if you got a pour, check the weather report. The question is, good or bad? So, is that good for the industry or bad for the industry? So work at your table to develop this master list. The change or 